Hello everybody and welcome to Lois and Morgana Davidson Art. It's Morgana here and today I'll be painting this dramatic scene of a stork at sundown coming in to rest on his nest. The first step in this painting is to sketch out your stork onto your paper of choice. I'm using Stratford brand cold press watercolour paper size A4 and this is the reference photograph that I used today, which you can find online on the image sharing website pixabay.com. The next step is to protect your outline using your chosen brand of masking fluid or drawing gum. Uh, I use Pebio brand drawing gum for this, and once it's dry, um, I'm just going to put a wash of clean water over the whole piece of paper here with my two inch brush, um, just to get it nice and wet and ready for the first wash. Now using the flat brush, I'm going to first introduce some lovely bright raw sienna uh, for a little golden sunset glow, followed up by some light indigo. I'm using my uh, large mop brush for this just to get a little bit more control over the paint, and over the movement of the paint uh, across the paper, of course, painting uh, wet and wet here. Next, I add in a little bit of alizarin crimson hue, which is a lovely bright colour, but is also an excellent mixer uh, and is really wonderful, sort of subtle, uh, dusty or sunset tones when mixed with the right colours. You can see I'm not really using it uh, on its own here, I'm blending it on the paper with the indigo and with the raw sienna. So at this point I was taking quite an experimental approach um, to the painting, seeing what sort of patterns and marks I could create uh, in order to set up a backdrop for this lovely bird. Uh, seeing as the reference photograph that I'm using is literally just the bird on its own with no backdrop, I feel like that gives us a wonderful sort of level of creative freedom to place it against whatever landscape or whatever background that we like. So here I just wanted to start building up texture and just get enough uh, interesting colour and detail into this background wash that it could certainly be turned into um, a loose landscape background of some description. You can see I'm coming in now with my sword liner brush and a bit of extra raw sienna to just add a little bit of extra detail, a few lines here and there, uh, before switching back to the mop brush and dabbing in a few more dark colours. And at this point it really is a simple matter of just building up your colour and texture in the initial wash, seeing where the brush strokes take you. Um, some of you may not like this colour combination, in which case please do feel free to use your own favourite colours uh, and favourite techniques. I was really enjoying the sort of slightly circular pattern of almost petals that the uh, the brush was creating here so I decided to enhance that with a little bit more indigo. Uh, as you can see the paper is still wet so my brush strokes are sort of softening down, losing their hard edges uh, and we're getting those lovely lost and found edges here uh, with the wet and wet wash which is exactly what I was hoping for. You can see I'm just using the very tips of the mop brush to introduce a bit more texture. Um, but before I go overboard and end up overworking it too much, I decided to pop on a little bit of salt. That's one of my favourite techniques to use for watercolour. I'm only using a very small sprinkling, as you can see here, just dotting a little bit into the sky area, this pale patch in the top right corner, and then uh, down below. You can see here I'm just dabbing some of the paint out of uh, the stalk area where it's pooling on top of the drawing gum or masking fluid. You just want to do this to enable a cleaner lift off um, of the drawing gum once everything is all dry. So this is how that first wash dried and I'm really pleased with how it's come out. You can see a little scattering of delicate salt blooms um, across the painting. And uh, after leaving it for a day to consider, uh, I decided to build up this darker area here, which already has this pleasing sort of almost circular pattern, um, into a nest for our bird to be coming in to land on. Uh, and to do this, I used, uh, as you can see here, my small 
uh, liner brush, my small sword liner, and I'm just slowly going around in vague circles, building up lines of colour uh, in quite a textural manner, just trying to get the impression of a built up layer of sort of sticks and twigs and the way a, a nest would naturally be created. So attempting to mimic that with my brush strokes. Um, it did take a little while, I won't include the full process here because uh, it did take rather a long time in terms of building colour and layering and waiting for the colours to dry. I will say that I used um, indigo for the dark uh, strokes that you can see here, um, intermingled with a bit of white gouache as well, which has the lovely opacity going over the uh, indigo, standing up to that dark colour, and also helping to build a little bit more of a sense of um, a structure and a solidity in this area of the painting. And you can see here how the white is standing up over the indigo and I'm using these really loose, quick little brush strokes, trying not to take too much time or be too careful over it, but just focusing on building up these overall shapes and the lights and the darks. After several sessions of this sort of layering process, um, I was happy with the general shape of the nest. It looked large enough to contain such a magnificent uh, bird with such an impressive wingspan. So I then decided to begin building up um, some fine branches around this left hand area just to settle that nest into the background of the landscape a little bit more. And again, I'm using indigo for this because it's a lovely uh, dark, strong colour and uh, I really enjoy when my paintings have that sort of colour harmony. Uh, of course, indigo isn't perhaps the natural colour of sort of trees and branches. Um, however, I think it worked for the painting, but if you are not a fan, you are very welcome to use perhaps, I think a raw umber would look really nice here as well and be a more naturalistic colour for building up plant detail. And once I was happy with my branches on this side, I built up a little extra colour and depth using my um, textural brush, as you can see here. Uh, repeating a similar process on the other side, literally just layering up some fine lines and then building up texture like this. Um, using a very simple sort of dabbing motion and then following up with a few sort of fine lines with my sword liner again to just build up the sense of some nice sort of tall twiggy branches and bits of foliage. At this point in the painting it's really uh, a matter of the artist's discretion as to how far you want to go with this sort of level of detail. You can go absolutely mad and build up loads of branches and loads of extra sort of bits and bobs and leaves and bushes and foliage, um, but I decided that sometimes um, perhaps less is more, particularly on this right hand side. And uh, as you can see on the right side with the nest, I've really built up the darts quite considerably um, in that bottom left corner particularly. So you can see that I'm actually lightening up the right hand side. Um, once I've put in those dark branches, just by using a little more white gouache to add some highlights down the side of the, uh, of the branches that I've drawn. And once that was fully dried, and really do make sure that everything is fully dry before you start this, it is time to remove all your masking fluid. And you can see here we've got this lovely clean shape. However, do bear in mind that your masking fluid will often remove um, a lot of the pencil detail from your drawing. So you may need to go back in uh, like I have here and just redraw a couple of the key details. You can see I've just redrawn the head and the neck uh, just to give myself a little bit of guidance when it comes to painting. So now I'm really happy with how our background looks, this lovely landscape. So my focus is on painting the stalk itself. So for the beak I used a mixture of um, alizarin crimson with some burnt sienna to create this nice reddish colour. And uh, as for the rest of the bird, I'm going to paint it mostly wet in wet. And uh, a large part of this bird is of course white, which 
brings us uh, some challenges as artists but also makes it a little bit easier when it comes to watercolour because of course we have the white of the paper there already um, so it's just a matter of, of uh, carefully enhancing what's already there you can see here or at least I, I hope you can see I hope the camera has picked it up um, I'm using very very diluted colours wet and wet to sort of create some shading and some shadows in the white area of the bird's body. So here, this is a bit of Payne's Grey now, uh, and I'm using a small round brush, size four, which for me is a perfect size to add in this kind of detail without it having to take too long, which uh, sometimes if you're using a very fine brush, you can find that uh, covering large areas of paper can really be a chore. So always do make sure that you have the right sort of size brushes uh, for the job. Uh, just adding a bit of extra darker shadow here around um, the tail where it fans out and around the bird's legs where the shadow would naturally be cast. Um, also in the body of the bird earlier I used a touch of raw sienna again um, just to help to translate that white of the paper into a shape and the sort of tone and shadow of the bird's body itself. It helps to create an idea of three-dimensionality and the actual shape of the creature rather than it just being a flat two-dimensional sort of plane of of something white essentially. At this point I'm happy with the sort of shadows that I've built up on the sort of inner side of the wing, the tail and the bird's body so it's time to add a bit more of a darker colour. So beginning again with Payne's Grey I'm just building up some shading on these wingtips first just because I want to give myself sort of a guide as to where to put the very dark paint um, without putting the very dark paint down first and risking getting it wrong and messing up quite a long uh, period of work that I've put into this painting so far. So here is the Payne's Grey going in to start with, um, basically providing the guidelines that I can now follow with the much stronger Payne's Grey. And of course you don't have to use Payne's Grey for this, you could certainly use any kind of dark grey or black watercolour paint. Um, the stalked colouring is of course black here on the wingtip, sort of black and white bird. Um, I tend to shy away from using an actual sort of a lamp black or something like that for um, these birds because so rarely are they actually very very dark black with no shadows and no reflections. I think Payne's Grey is uh, a nice happy medium in between blackest black and uh, palest grey. You can uh, dilute it to be really lovely and pale or you can use it like I am here uh, really quite intensely to give a lovely contrast. And you can see that for this section of the painting I switched back to using a fine detail brush um, just for that little bit extra um, amount of control that it gives me with these dark colours to begin with. You can see how useful it is here just making sure that there's that clean smooth line along the top of the feather and the wing where the, um, the pin feathers as you can see are sort of folded over here where the bird is uh, coming into land. It's slightly an awkward shape um, rather than the more traditional wing shape which is um, the one on the right. So I wanted to do this one first mostly because I wanted to make sure that I got it right. Now with areas like this that are perhaps a little bit awkward and could potentially go wrong, it is always worth just taking your time, perhaps using a smaller brush than you normally would, just to get that detail right before you then move on to the rest of the painting. You can see now that I switch back to my uh, size 4 brush to fill in the rest of the dark colour on the wing here because now I'm a bit more confident uh, with it now that I've got this awkward bit up here done. I think it is worth taking the time sometimes with uh, areas like this in a painting where you've got an awkward angle or a bit of foreshortening like we've got here, you've got a shadow or a folded wing or something that could potentially look a little awkward uh, if painted wrong. Now 
right here you can see I'm feeling a bit more confident now and so bringing in some more Payne's Grey and just pulling the darts into the shapes of the feathers that are already sort of there for us using the uh, the masking fluid of course and just bringing those details up and into the wing and just getting a really nice sort of transition between this dark colour and of course the very very pale paint that we've already got here this sort of white area of the wing that has just been really really basically shaded with some very 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 light Payne's grey and now here this is just the finishing touch to these uh, dark areas along the wing I'm using paint almost straight from the tube uh, really nice and dark to just give an extra depth to these wing edges and to follow the pattern up and along the wing and then it is a relatively simple matter to simply repeat the process on the other wing And now all that I need to still do here is basically put in some of the final details. So here I'm just putting in the colour on the legs and I'm using the same colour that I mixed up to paint the bird's beak earlier, which is um, alizarin crimson mixed with a bit of the um, burnt sienna. And because of the shading detail that I already put around the tail area earlier, this has created the outline of the legs for us using a bit of negative painting there, which uh, is then very easy to just fill in with um, a small enough brush. And now after painting the leg in full, you can see I'm just coming back in with the, the same colour but slightly darker, uh, slightly stronger I should say, mix of paint, less water and just adding a few little touches of detail along the leg just to make it not look like a one big sort of long block of colour so there's a little bit of texture in there. And I'm just going to do that with the other leg as well once this one has dried before moving on to some of the smaller details, which uh, I'm just gonna show you here in this close up. So I'm using Payne's Grey and my fine detail brush. Of course, you could use uh, black here uh, to just put in little details like the stork's eye, a thin line down the edge of the beak and uh, a little nostril along the top here. If this is the kind of thing that you struggle to do with a brush, uh, which I certainly did struggle with for uh, a very long time, so I always used to do these fine details um, in fine liner pen after I'd done all the sort of main parts of the painting. I would come in with my, you know, very fine point two fine liner and just add in these little details with the pen that I felt a lot more confident and in control of. So that's certainly something you can do here um, if you want to add those little details, but if you're slightly worried about having a fine enough brush or about your ability to control that brush at the moment. And now talking of finishing touches, you can see I'm adding a little bit more colour here. This is again really, really diluted down Payne's Grey just to build up the shadow, just because I felt like it needed a little bit of extra shading around the legs and the underside of the body. You can always go back in and build up a little extra shadow and a little bit of extra shading after the main bulk of the bird is done. Uh, always trust your instincts as to whether or not something looks right or not. And now finally, just to enhance those lovely little salt sprinkles we've already got, I'm putting in a tiny spattering of opaque white gouache just around the bird, um, just to give a little extra delicacy, a little extra detail. And there we are, this is the finished painting. And I'm absolutely thrilled with how this one turned out. Um, I love paintings that always come uh, as a little bit of a surprise. And I didn't go into this one uh, envisaging that the um, dark sort of mess that I made uh, during the wash stage would become 
um, a nest for this majestic bird um, but I'm so pleased that it turned out this way I think it always pays to um, be slightly flexible when you come to painting watercolour and to see the potential that sometimes arises um, in the march that you're making uh, almost by accident as it were um, but thank you everybody so much for watching and I really hope you enjoyed this video. I certainly enjoyed painting it for you. Uh, any questions or comments, please leave them in the uh, comments area below the video. Um, but that's all from me today. So I wish you a wonderful rest of the day, everybody, and very happy painting.